I'm Brad Bernatek. I'm the managing director for the WG Labs Fund and Accelerator, where we invest in, we invest in and support mission-aligned seed state startups. Um, WG Labs is part of Western Governors University and supports early, early stage innovation, both within the university as well as in the field more broadly, both in terms of higher ed and workforce. We're at a really interesting moment. I want to sort of start with, in the words of the Vera Center, the U.S. is the epicenter for mass incarceration in the world. The U.S. The US represents 4% of the world's population, but 16% of incarceration in the world. So I want to say that one more time. The United States represents 4% of the world's population, but 16% of incarceration around the world. <coughs> there are over 2 million people incarcerated in the US. Um, and so I just want you to sit on that for a minute to sort of recognize the scale of the challenge in terms of uh, mass incarceration in the US. The good news is beginning in July, for the first time in 25 years, up to 700,000 incarcerated individuals will have access to Pell Grants for the first time in 25 years. And there's really strong evidence that shows that high quality prison education programs uh, can dramatically reduce recidivism. Um, I'm really excited to mo motivate, or excuse me, I'm really excited to, to moderate this panel. Before I sort of start, I wanna say one thing that is for the, for the folks on this panel. As I said, we invest in and support seed stage companies. Nucleos, Noah from Nucleos, We've invested in Nucleos uh, as a seed stage investor, and we're in the process of evaluating the potential of a pilot whereby WGU could take advantage of the Nucleos learning platform to deliver a high quality WGU degree program to a correctional facility and potentially take advantage of the new Pell program coming online. So we're, we've been working together for a few months and we're really excited. Uh, I'm really excited to moderate this panel today because I really do think we are at an inflection point where we have a really a once in a generation opportunity to create the prison to college pipeline as opposed to the, the school to prison pipeline. So there's a tremendous opportunity uh, in this moment of time. And so I wanna start off by sort of, I've introduced myself and I wanna give Jody, Noah, and Rob an opportunity to introduce themselves. So Jody, do you wanna start? Sure, well, I'm Jody Anderson Jr. Um, really happy to be here today speaking to you all. Uh, I think just for some context, uh, I think last year, I think it was last year, for the past year, uh, graduate from Stanford's Graduate School of Education um, with a degree in ed tech and policy. Uh, I also did my undergrad there as well, so in political science with a minor in Mandarin. Before that, I was at Cornell University studying industrial labor relations and government. Um, the connection to uh, this issue here is uh, I initially uh, got into Cornell through Cornell's prison education program. Um, so clearly, in order to take advantage of that program, you have to be incarcerated. I don't think it's no surprise, uh, given uh, the environment that I was born into. Um, so I spent my, uh, my youth inside incarcerated settings, so from 15 to 25. But I have the privilege, of course, of joining the program, uh, graduating uh, within two years, uh, became uh, the youngest graduate, uh, became the first black valedictorian, and then Cornell, along with Scott, and he'll speak to that, a number of professors, um, launched a campaign to get me out of prison early. So that's how I get out, go to Stanford, um, and then got very much interested into technology, being as a, uh, a way to not only bring your ideas to fruition, but also to um, impact people's lives at scale. Um, so joined uh, Stanford's Accelerator for Learning and built two products in that space, one helping youth um, avoid incarceration, so connecting them to rehabilitative programs, um, educational programs, including bringing coding and design courses into incarcerated settings so that youths could be ready for, for the future that they're going to return to at some point. Um, and then an employment platform as well, where we match just impacted individuals with upskilling and reskilling opportunities, along with rehabilitative services and community partners that are within their local network, um, and second chance employers. So, so a true testament of the power of education uh, and technology um, to bring people into the modern era. But thank glad to be here. Thank yeah, thank you, Jody. I just want to say before we move on, I mean, Jody and I, we, we connected because as I, I mean, I. I this is one of two panels at this conference that's talking about this opportunity. And um, when I learned that Rob and Jody were doing a panel, I asked if they would participate in this. So I'm so honored, just yeah. given your personal story, like it just speaks to the testament, like you said, it's the power of education, the power of opportunity. So, so thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Um, Noah, can you tell us a little bit about Nucleos and what, so what, how'd you get involved in this work and what, what led you to start Nucleos? Well, certainly. 
Uh, thanks for having me here today, Brad, and it's great to be here with everyone. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nucleos, and before I got involved with this work, I was actually involved in education technology overseas. And access to education has always been something that's been really valued in my family, and I've seen how important it is in my own journey. And I've always been interested in how we can expand access to education and training to promote a more equal society and give people access to opportunities. Mm -hmm. So before founding Nucleos, I was actually working at Stanford's Graduate School of Education, and I was leading some of the technology around projects to take technology, the best e-learning content, and package it into small offline servers to take it into places where schools didn't have access to books or internet connectivity at the time. They are working in Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia. And then I had a, another colleague from a different line of work and uh, a friend who spent six months in federal prison. And that really opened my eyes to some of the barriers around incarceration and access to education and training in the U.S. and how big of a lack that was. I mean, the more I learned, I was just astonished by the scale and the scope of the problem. And kind of the aha moment was, wow, it's harder to bring e-learning into a lot of U.S. prisons than these remote village schools in Zimbabwe that are so far disconnected from everything. And that didn't make any sense to me. So that led me to, to ultimately uh, found Nucleos with a goal to promote a more just society through education and training. And what, with Nucleos, we have a secure platform that can aggregate the best e-learning solutions out there, such as Western Governors University. And the philosophy behind it is people on the inside should have access to the same type of education opportunities people do on the outside. And the technological gap there was there need to be a, a secure platform that was flexible enough to meet the needs of um, a very fragmented uh, correction system. So that's what we've built. And uh, it's an honor to be here today with, with Brad and the other panelists. So great. Thank, Thank you, you Noah. Rob, can I, I'm going to end with you. Can you, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this work and, and, and about the Cornell Prison Project? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Rob. Uh, I am the director of Cornell University's Prison Education Program. I've uh, been involved in this work for 15 years. How I got involved um, actually was because I was involved in a contentious moment of police community relations in Illinois where I was in grad school. And um, anyone who remembers back then, uh, there was a big court case in the Supreme Court about the police in Illinois saying you couldn't videotape them. Uh, anyone who's been watching the news for the past 10 years probably noticed that the power of videotaping the police reveals quite a bit of things going on in there. Would that we had such a thing happen in prisons. Um, in any case, at that moment, uh, I was uh, harassing professors to donate to a fund to help someone who had been incarcerated because he had videotaped the police doing a traffic stop. And uh, professors got the idea, this guy Rob is for some reason willing to take on the police. Maybe we should send him to this new in uh, initiative to do courses inside the prison for the university. So um, as a grad student, I got involved. And then uh, when that prison got too crazy to be there anymore, I, I was fortunate to get land this job at Cornell and meet great people like Jody and uh, learn a lot in return. So that's me. Great. Thank you, Rob. So I'm going to stay with you because I was going to ask you, just given your long <laughs> involvement, can you just give us some history about like prison education in the last 25 years? As I said before, like for the last 25 years, incarcerated individuals have not had access to Pell Grants. And so, you know, Rob, it'd be, it'd be helpful to just a little bit of the history of sort of like, what was it like before the ban 25 years ago? What it's been like in the last 25 years? Um, and like I said, what, what, was, what was different before the loss of Pell Grants? Yeah. Uh, Sure. Yeah, and keep me to like two minutes. So yeah. um, <laughs> I'm watching. I'm watching my. I, I <laughs> yeah. So the rise of college and prison it really came out of the Attica riots and a bunch of contentious moments in the counterculture where the policing and prisons regime in America was seen as really counter to a bunch of political movements trying to change what the world was all about. Um, part of that was Pell grants were available as mass incarceration grew, college and prison grew, and so there's a lot of critique of that era of college and prison because it was sort of part of the program, the prison program that is. Uh, meaning it wasn't necessarily a great disruption to mass incarceration that there was college and prison. It was kind of part of how things operate. It was one of the things, one of the hustles you could have, if you will. Um, anyway, it was the 1990s and it was the take away everything from those criminals. They don't deserve anything. Why should my kid have to pay for college and this person gets a Pell Grant and gets a degree after you know, hurting someone ostensibly. And so they wiped out all the uh, programs, including Pell Grants in 1994. 
Uh, our current president was at the signing ceremony, patting uh, Hillary and Bill on the back. Um, that's just what that moment was, you know. And, and if anyone lived through that time, several in the room could attest, that was the feeling in the whole country. I was going to New York City at the time. You know, we'd have the little bars on our cars. You know, we'd be watching our trunks getting broken into. There's a lot of crime in the country. So it was really the mood then. I'm not trying to impugn anyone. Um, 25 years without Pell Grants, what we've been doing, mainly was led by people on the inside. That's probably the best way to tell the story. For the women at Bedford Hills, Mercy College and the guys at Sing Sing, and a bunch of other places around the country left these few polka dots left where there was still college and prison, mainly because the folks on the inside reached out to the community and those that could either volunteer mm -hmm. or fundraise to make it possible to have a low cost model for college and prison, almost entirely in person, uh, for the past couple of decades. Um, Cornell University was doing this by waiving tuition, mainly working with volunteers and graduate and undergraduate students to do a lot of volunteer labor. Um, and that's the model I inherited when I got that job 10 years ago. Um, so it's a, an odd comeuppance to then see um, Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump return us to having Pell Grants in prison in 2023, this is the implementation year, um, and to watch the Department of Corrections now kind of fumble over, right, and we were supposed to be rehabilitating people this whole time or something. Because if you look at what's in the prisons, uh, if you've ever gone to see it, we know we don't, there's no cameras to put it on YouTube. Um, it's really a punishment factory and a mass producer of people who are going to have a very hard time in society, not a pipeline to college. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Jody, we talk, can you talk a little bit about your experience and, you know, in terms of, like, as we talked about, like, in the, in the Cornell Prison Project, you were supported by private donations, committed activists, and sort of just what your experience with that was? Yeah, for sure. No, I think it speaks to the, the counterculture, that, counterculture that, that Rob was describing. Um, a number of these individuals who see the value of education, right, as a vehicle to, of course, social mobility, um, but then also, like, I think, in and of itself is just good for, like, a human being, especially being under those conditions. Uh, but we had a true education, like, through Cornell's Prison Education Program. Um, like, professors from every discipline uh, coming in, teaching us every, every subject you can imagine, the same curriculum that exists all on campus, and I, I'm a testament to that because I went to, <laughs> to Cornell, like it was the same exact thing on that high quality education, um, and then workshops and, and office hours, right, so creating a collegiate experience inside of those four walls um, also gives you something to look forward to beyond your sentence, right, like here's a true opportunity, it's a different network that I could have access to, but it was only in certain, like, locations, right? Mm -hmm. and so if you weren't fortunate enough, unfortunate, oxymoronic, but to be in a particular institution that Cornell was, was, there, was in, you didn't have access to education, right? You'd have to, they only have limited amount of programs, right, that don't really translate to any uh, real world opportunities, right? There are no computers, right? So there isn't any programming, there isn't any like designing, right? There's none of, there's no training to repair you for like the real world, right? There isn't any, I mean, it's like a lack of digital tools inside there at large. And so um, just was fortunate to be a part of that, but then also understood that when I returned to society, uh, some of my friends that I grew up with um, that were returning as well because it's cyclical, didn't have those opportunities, right? So like, may maybe they got their GED, but that's it, right? And, and yes, it's like quite unfortunate and sad. So definitely think I'm appreciative of the reemergence, but um, I think more work definitely has to be done in this space. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Jody. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to shift gears to talk about the opportunity, but I have one more question for Noah, just to sort of like, again, give you the background in terms of, you know, Noah, as we were preparing, you talked a little bit about sort of like what the, what the business models and the last generation of technology look like. Can you just talk a little bit about that in yeah. terms of like, you know? Well, well, certainly. So a lot of people aren't aware, but over the last five years or so, there's there's been a big growth of technology inside corrections. And it's come in under perver in business models with perverse incentives that really disincentivize bringing in high quality education technology. Um, and the, the basic business model involves having incarcerated people pay on a per minute basis mm -hmm. to use devices such as a tablet with access to communications and access to video calls and entertainment, music, videos primarily and it's designed to generate as much revenue as possible. Um, so this is problematic for high quality education. Uh, lowest quality kind of check the box education is coming in, but education either has to be offered free on those tablets, in which case the companies want to make it low quality and limited so it doesn't compete with paid minutes to buy movies and music. So I've had those executives at those companies tell me that directly. 
oh, we like the idea of better education, but don't make it too good, you know. So <laughs> that's, um, that's one incentive. And then if it is coming in, we've also seen actually pay per minute education. You know, some, oh, Khan, Khan Academy, that's entertainment. We're going to charge per minute for that. Um, so what that's done is it's really sucked all the oxygen out of the room for high quality education technology to come in, right? And um, a, a key part of this business model is that you know, a good part of that revenue actually goes back to the Department of Corrections. Um, so you have a Department of Corrections who you know, is getting typically less than 1% of their operating budget um, coming back. Not a lot of money, but in the process, totally shooting themselves in the foot and undermining the complete rehabilitative mission. Um, so that's starting to change. Public policy is starting to catch up. Uh, the FCC has been lowering some of the rates across the nation starting this year for prison phone calls. I um, mean, that's an important first step. Uh, you might have, you know, a 15-minute call cost $25, and, you know, to uh, deposit the money, it's a 30% fee. You know, you have things like this. Uh, so it's just really uh, quite ridiculous. Um, but there's a big movement to go more towards an agency-paid model um, where you have non-exploitive technology that's bringing in actually the same high-quality tools people might be using on the outside. Great. Thanks, Noah. Okay, so I want to shift gears. That was a lot of just to kind of bring you up to where we're at today and remind you again, this once in a generation opportunity, up to 700,000 in incarcerated individuals having access to Pell Grants. Rob, can you just tell us a little bit about this program and sort of like, you know, second chance Pell and sort of like a little bit of background on this? Sure. Um, yeah, as I said, it was a surprise that this got kind of snuck into the omnibus bill in December 2020. Um, if folks uh, remember this time, it's between the Trump losing election and, and the inauguration of Joe Biden. So it was a very distracting time. Um, it wasn't a big headline um, that it was added to the omnibus spending bill. It turns out Lamar Alexander, <laughs> the retiring senator, went over to his buddy Mitch McConnell and said, we got to put this stuff back in the prisons. A lot of folks in the South, you'd be surprised, mm -hmm. um, have some real heart for folks that are incarcerated. You may remember the you know, Mississippi governor like exonerating all the people that cleaned the governor's mansion in Mississippi in the, back, in the old days. These things happen because folks have some kind of relationship to the prison system. Anyway, the um, thing got passed by folks that were um, very much trusting of law enforcement. So there are new regulations added to Pell Grants. Otherwise, Pell Grants basically a low um, income or, 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 or uh, you know, uh, a grant to those who don't have the resources to pay for college. The new Pell for people in prison is going to require the Department of Corrections to authorize the program that exists that the Pell Grant will be used toward. Um, additionally, the Departments of Corrections will be in, involved in educational evaluation. Um, there probably couldn't be a, a party I'm less interested in having evaluate the quality of higher education than Departments of Corrections across the United States um, for reasons that no one other, and all of us probably could explain. Um, but the basic gist of it is there's going to be a new way to do the FAFSA form in prison without computers because it's a low-tech space. Um, someday, the United States uh, prison systems will get up to the regular reality of computers, but it's, it's not there right now. Um, and there are some other provisions that have been removed that would routinely remove people in prison from being able to enroll in college in the old Pell Grant days registration for selective service. So if you were incarcerated at the age of 15 and then pushed up into the adult system, you probably didn't register for the draft, right? So this would happen in the 90s. People would try to go to college. They didn't register for selective service. They'd be excluded from college. That um, requirement is gone. Also certain provisions around um, catching a drug offense um, have been removed from the FAFSA exclusion process. So um, Pell Grants will be broadly available to people in prison. Um, colleges that want to offer a college in prison will have to register with their Department of Corrections, which will then attest to the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. Yes, this college is allowed to operate here. Um, but other than that, it is basically the same process. If, if you can demonstrate that you do not have the income to pay above a certain level, um, a Pell Grant should be available to you. Uh, it's in the realm of $6,000 per year for a fully enrolled college student. Um, and for some schools, that will be sufficient to provide a good education. Thanks, Rob. So I want I'm going to wrap up on this question, no, with you around the role of online education and sort of the, the potential pilot that we're we're evaluating together right now. But before I do that, Jody, can you say a little bit more about your experience with technology, like sort of like when, when you were in the program? Oh no, solid. There was there was zero technology. <laughs> like there there, there was zero. Experience. There were there were no there were no tablets. We still had the they have the phones that are on like a rotary. Like it was 
it's like living in the 1940s for sure. So zero technology. Um, we had in-person programming. So like professors had to come in physically, bring us physical books, physical papers, right? And we had like a traditional collegiate experience like under non-ideal terms, but that's how it functioned there. When I transitioned to society, the implementation of tablets happened, right? And so I didn't, like, I don't know what that experience is like, but from uh, the individuals I'm still in communication with and also that, that I work with uh, through, through the platform have described, like, the opportunity that exists there, right? Like, they have access to these devices, largely entertainment, and Noah was speaking to some of the, some of the problems there for sure. Um, and I think on the, on the other end, like, for, for youth, right, we notice there also isn't a ton of technology in, in the side of facilities either, but they do have computer labs, at least in California. And so what we've been doing there is, you know, bringing the same like curriculum from Stanford, so code in place, um, with the same servers, et cetera, right, and having like certain websites whitelisted, right, and the, at least the educational um, system within California for the juvenile prisons, they they are they are they're just in alignment with educating the youth, right, because they are returning, and so we've been able to implement like these programs online uh, with, with them as well, which I think is fabulous, right? So having the youth interact with people from the industry, coming in, like helping them code, helping them design, um, but then also like taking real courses, um, just in case we're not allowed to go in person because of COVID and, and, and other uh, events such as that. Greg, can I share one thing? It's germane to this. Um, yeah. That prison, Auburn prison, where we're still operating, I was there a month ago, they're still using a pre-Windows system yeah. <laughs> to do the classification and monitoring of the people in their custody. So you go to the front desk of that prison, and they are printing out a manifest for all the day's activities on a printer with those little holes in the side. I know some people in the room are old enough to know that. It's in a big stack, and then that goes to each of the housing units, and they have to push F1 to get through the different fields. And that, so the reason it's germane is because those are the gatekeepers to why don't we have better modern systems in the hands of the incarcerated folks. The staff running the place who have custody over human beings are using that system to keep track of where everyone is. So just to give an image of the outsider's perspective on that prison specifically too. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. I, one point of correction though, we had rotary phones in the 70s. <laughs> as late as the 70s, maybe even the 80s. So I just wanna, yeah. as a Gen Xer, I just have to, <laughs> I'm old but not that old. Um, so Noah, so Noah, tell us a little bit about, so like in this, you can talk a little bit about Nucleos and sort of like the role of online education as, as you see it with Nucleos and, and talk a little bit about the pilot that we're evaluating in collaboration right now. Oh, certainly. The role of online education is so critical for this work. You look at a typical Department of Corrections today and a lot of them, they may have only 5% of the population getting access to an education and training program. Mm -hmm. So there's a big need. Without technology, there's, there's no way to scale it. Yeah. Um, you have to do it very carefully, though. You want to make sure you're also fostering and supporting in-person programs as well. The in-person connection is, you know, of course, critical as well. Learning is a social phenomena. And if you're incarcerated, you're heavily denied access to, uh, you know, access to other people, especially those there to really help you. Um, so that piece is, is critical, but you need it to scale, right? And the data is just so dramatic. When, uh, before Pell was banned in the 60s and 70s, about 10% of people who were incarcerated were enrolled in post-secondary programs. And after Pell was banned in 1994, it went down to about 2%. Uh, Vera Institute says about 30% of people are eligible. And you know, today, maybe 5% or so um, might be enrolled. So there's a big opportunity to to scale that up. So with Western Governors University, we're piloting first one degree, a business degree, and what's critical about what we're looking to bring in in terms of programs, they have to be high quality. Uh, so how do we measure that? We use kind of crude proxies at, at first. Um, we want people who are leaders in their field. Western Governors University is the, by some measures, the biggest college by enrollment university in the United States. I mean, we want something that's going to lead to a degree, a diploma, or an industry-recognized vocational certificate. Um, so we're doing a full bachelor's degree in business, and the vision would be to then expand to be able to offer as many of the 60-plus degree programs that Western Governors University has, um, and, and all the support that comes with that, career services, counseling, everything a WGU student would get on the outside. Um, and people can have the ability to continue that once they leave. 
Uh, it's important to note 95 to 96 percent of people who are incarcerated will get out one day. So this is almost everyone behind bars. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting to be starting on this pilot. And the vision is it can help supplement a lot of the in-state and in-person programs and give people on the inside the same choices on the outside. Do I want to do an inside college? Uh, do I want to do an in-person one? Do I want to do an online program? Um, which might have more options and selections. Thanks, Noah. So one thing I'd add, so we're, we made this investment, when did we start? We made the investment last October. Mm -hmm. And so we're really on the front end of this. And so we're like at early stages in terms of evaluating the potential for the pilot and going through really all the processes we have to that like, as Noah was talking about, like from an approval standpoint, we have to get approval from, we have to identify a pilot site, which we're, we're doing together right now. We'll have to get approval from that Department of Corrections then we'll have to go to our, our uh, WGU's accreditor, and the WGU's accreditor will have to approve, and then it'll have to go to the U.S. Department of Education to get final approval. So it's a pretty lengthy process, and we're, like, my observation would be it's, we're early on, even though there was Second Chance Pell, which has been in place for five years, um, everyone's really still trying to figure things out, and there's a lot to learn. So we're hoping, you know, by the end of this year, early next year, that we could, you know, launch a pilot uh, but we have a lot of things to do before we do that. So um, I want to shift gears and just talk a little bit about um, just challenges. We've talked a little bit about that. So I want to start off with uh, kind of like from both Rob and Noah's perspective. Rob, I want to start with you in terms of more of the programmatic challenges. Like, I want to again, it's like a tremendous opportunity. But as you've heard, I think already, um, there just there are a lot of challenges in trying to sort of do this in the context of a correctional facility do it with fidelity, with high quality. And so, Rob, I want to just based on, talk to us a little bit about the programmatic challenges you see, even as we have this opportunity. And then, Noah, I want to follow up with you in terms of more of the technological challenges. Sure, I feel like I'm the bad news guy here, but um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the challenges are great, um, largely because of the thing I mentioned earlier, because you've really got this walled off institution that's not subject to the normal sort of oversight that other institutions are. Even the governor of a given state might not really know what's going on on, on, a, on a granular scale within um, a prison, even though it might be 5 to 10% of a state budget in some cases. Um, so, and the results of that and the sort of perverse results of the power dynamics in prisons are well known and well studied. Um, how does that impact college? Um, people who are employed by prisons might not be college educated and might resent people who are incarcerated getting a higher level of education than they were getting on the outside. Um, they also may have um, pet theories about why people go to college and how they get there. So like suggesting that they never could for some reason, though Pell Grants would have been available to them if they had the low level of income. I just, or even to call it income is kind of wrong because of like what, what's been described here. If you make 20 cents an hour and then are required to pay that back to the state to be able to send a message to someone, you really are not earning income. You're just like cycling something that extracts your labor here and takes away your family there. So, um, so people are upset in prison. Um, people are moved around a lot. That's a thing that really impacts colleges. So when developing systems like the one you guys are developing, um, one thing to be aware of is that people can be suddenly moved from one prison to another within the state. Um, and it can almost seem targeted, particularly if folks seem to be the ones that are um, intelligent, savvy, um, perhaps socially engaged, so capable of influencing others. Uh, prison tend to disrupt those types of things. And so this is something that the in-person programs experience all the time, even just on a level of not letting a person move around the school building, um, but certainly around the state. Um, I, I've had years where 40% of our students got moved to another prison. So if you've got a system that allows a person to pick it right back up with whatever template they're handed at a prison B, maybe that's something that um, might be thought of in this context. Um, but then I would say the final and, and largest challenge, and I'm not sure I have an answer for this one, is what do you do about the fact that incarceration is primarily a physical, subjective experience? Where they literally take your clothes and force you to wear something else. They literally put you behind a metal wall and take away all your stuff and all your relationships. And, and, and what do we do about the fact that one of the main remedies we're finding now is inexpensive ways of providing remote services. So, Texas used to have in-person visits. You'd see your father and get to actually hug the person. Now you can see a screen to which you pay to have a video call with your father. And, and, the, and the pandemic had a way of accelerating those dynamics. 
Um, so to have real solidarity, that's really a, a, one of the challenges. We're also trying to develop ways to work with our students digitally. Um, how do you really forge the bonds that are typical of a good university experience um, without having some kind of on-the-ground presence or post-release? That's another one. Other folks that have done in-prison, remote education, do they have an office in the state that provides for some bridging between that degree and actually getting a job in the world of the state they're going to parole to? Um, it's just another piece of it. As soon as you get to the point where you got your program, you're going to see, as I did, it, it took a few years, but oh, now we got to make sure that folks actually can use the degree. Mm -hmm. um, and people are dramatically disempowered by prison. So I would see folks, their resume, Cornell University, all the way down at the bottom, the smallest font you could find. Then you went to a university that stands up anywhere in the world. Put that way at the top, you know? Um, so there are these other things that are sort of um, beyond the formal curriculum um, that we're really beckoned to attend to um, for the human mission of what education is trying to be in this world. Yeah, that's great. Noah, before you jump in, I just want to say, like, one of the things that was interesting to us about, about this opportunity, just because, not just because of what I talked about earlier, about just the tremendous, this moment in time, is that sort of the nature of the WGU model, it's all about kind of flexibility, affordability, and relevance. And so, like, it's flexible and asynchronous. So if you, if you do move around, like your your education can move with you potentially affordability i'm i'm gonna i'll say you can just about pay for a wgu with with a pell grant just about so um we see that and then the then relevance it's all about career connection and so i think we think we have an infrastructure in place around the country whereas people leave the system and re-enter society you know the opportunity to kind of connect them with you know family sustaining and fulfilling jobs um, and we also have a community of care that's sort of like because it's primarily online, every student has a program mentor that they're meeting with on a regular basis. So these are the types of things that we think have the potential um, in this moment of time. So having said that, Noah, from a technological standpoint, briefly, like the challenges you see. Yeah, there's a few on the technological side. If you want to bring in high quality programs, you need to leverage the internet access. So that's a big th thing that we've looked at with our technology is how can we bring in leading programs from the best providers, Coursera, Pearson, Edmentum, <coughs> Ingenuity, Western Governors University, of course, um, et cetera. And the answer is network filtering, 24-7 monitoring, and constantly updating and reviewing the sites, right? So you have to do a lot there. Um, so network is a big challenge. Um, another is, uh, and correctional agencies are starting to make that investment and in putting their own networks in. That's really been picking up now. Um, you know, another challenge, of course, I talked about some of the public policy side, but there's really a role for the government to go in and ban technology that is coming in under these exploitative business models. And states are stepping up. California and Connecticut are the first two states to fully ban some of the worst practices. And there's like five other states or so involved in these efforts as well, looking to do this. So that's really important. Um, and then making all the different content accessible, right? You have, you know, 1,000, 2,000 to one student teacher ratios, right? I'm in a Correctional agency, it's a microcosm of a little society in there. They've got to deliver every type of education, vocational, academic, social, emotional wellness, everything from adult basic education to college. So there's a lot of different siloed education programs. When you look at that digitally, something we find, spend a lot of time on is aggregating and integrating those programs um, and figuring out how you do things like learning records and standardizing data from you know, any different number of, uh, of programs. Um, connecting people to jobs is another big piece. Um, and so we're putting everything on one learning record that people can take with them between facilities and to re-entry, to show with employers, and looking to work with other programs that are also helping connect to uh, employers as well. Great. So thank you. So I want to make sure we're, we've got about nine minutes left. I want to make sure we leave a little bit of time for questions. So as we talked about at the beginning, I want to do like for each of you, give you a, like a closing remark in terms of short, maybe 30 seconds about like what's your ask, what's your call to action for the folks in the audience. And so Noah, I want to start with you. Um, Noah, we'll go to Rob and then we'll, we'll close out with Jody and then hopefully have some Q&A. Certainly. So for investors, we're at an investor conference fund ethical business models, especially where you're working with populations denied freedom. Um, for the general public, I've talked about some of the policy changes. What drives policy is public awareness, and I think the public awareness that we all need to have 
is that um, there's no trade-off between giving opportunity, promoting more justice here, and public safety. They're all positively correlated. By expanding opportunity, giving it more justly to people who are on the inside, we're promoting public safety. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, if folks are going into prison to do remote education, I think the most important thing for me would be that it be, yeah, non-competitive with the other colleges, particularly the folks in the community that are on the ground. Because we saw this in New York. The, the feeling was that if there was a remote uh, college program, in that case from a college in Ohio, um, that there wouldn't be a local one. So the, the college outside the door where people are paroling to couldn't work with folks from their own community in the prison because someone from Ohio came and did it and set up a P.O. box within the state. That's what I think would probably be antagonistic with the existing movement, which really, again, came from the folks on the inside. And the second thing I would say is it would be really lovely to see um, folks doing remote education inside prisons um, really formally empower incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people at, on advisory boards or in other functions um, to advise what it actually is received as on the inside, what this actually feels like, um, and what would be, from the perceptions of the folks who are incarcerated, empowering, um, yeah, and humanizing, really like listening to what their interests are. Um, so that's not, because folks in prison, I've not been in prison myself, <laughs> have so much the experience, I feel, of saying someone has shown up from outside to do something to us, and they've decided this is what's good for us, and they didn't stop to ask. And so there's a real opportunity at the front end, as you said, to from day one say, you know, make sure Jody's on your panel. You know, it's, 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 here's our closer. All right. Yeah. And <laughs> Jody, we're going to close out with you so, and, then, and then do a little Q&A. No, solid. I, I think it would be two, two asks. One, uh, you know, echoing some of, some of Scott's sentiments. Uh, people feel empowered when they see other individuals who are from different parts of society actually show up for them, help them out, interact with them, right? Especially in an incarcerated setting. Um, so, like, I know people in here, know individuals who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. So we're like 77 million human beings, so you can throw a rock and hit someone who has, you know, been impacted. And so I think it is incumbent on all of us to actually dedicate a portion, like, of our life, right? This isn't, like, a full-time job, but to actually uh, interact with this population. And I think particularly when people are young, right? So if it wasn't for some of those early college programs, some of those early GD programs, where people are volunteering their time to come in and, and help us like, get some semblance of an education. Um, some of the blessings that came later on in life wouldn't have been able to take advantage of them. So definitely, like, it is worth it. I think especially up front like, for youth who are still stuck in that school to prison pipeline. And then on, on the back end, right, it's all about economic advancement. Right? Like a ton of you know, individuals who are incarcerated is due to crimes of poverty. Right? And so you can help someone uh, you know, increase their, their economic mobility, uh, help them increase their earning potential. I think that is the way forward. And I'm sure we all have jobs in here, right? And so like there are job openings, right? Even with the economy going down, like quite literally help somebody get a job, right? If you actually believe in them, if you actually believe they're talented, right? Then you, should, you shouldn't mind working right next to them, right? And so it isn't relying on someone else to do the right thing. It's you as a human being who understands this issue, like you have to commit to action. So that's my only thing. Thank you, Jody. No um, okay, we've got about five minutes, uh, and so like, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, right here. Thank you. Uh, I work for WGU, and one of the things that we were discussing in a project that I was recently working on in the College of General Education is the potential for bringing this to, excuse me, to incarcerated populations. Um, but at the time, obviously, the Pell Grants weren't and still aren't available. But we were discussing the challenges that 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 might be presented. And one thing that came up was the assessments at WGU are, are uh, proxied and, and the students are expected to be in a room with no distractions and on camera. And I assume that that would be a challenge in something like a prison. And I was just wondering if that had come up in discussions of how this pilot at WGU might be implemented and what if there's any solutions that have been discussed. Can I so also add to that? Because we both work in the same space with it. Um, I actually support College of Business. So we both work on launching new programs and initiatives for WGU. So this is actually very exciting. But with, as a subset of that is the when you said the um, the program mentors, right? That would be a phone call. You know, you have phone calls all the time. And if there's a cost in, into that, you know, how would you support having those daily touch points with your program mentor to have the help that you need to get through yeah. your 
course. So I'll say a couple things real quickly and then see if we can get one more question. So first, we're actually, I mean, as part of the pilot, we've been working with student success. And so there's going to be online, there's going to be on-site proctoring for at least the pilot to get us started. And then from a communication standpoint, the Nucleos learning platform has a secure communications kind of uh, functionality that we're going to take advantage of. And so, again, part of this, this is part of the reason we're doing, the, we're evaluating the pilot because it's like, it's like there's a lot to figure out in terms of how to do this with fidelity and with quality. Uh, so happy to talk more about that afterwards. Maybe one more question um, right here. So, be, first of all, thank you for being here. It's been a great session for me. I would love to know more about career pathways and how those are explored, how those are are part of the, the curriculum that's offered through a multiple set of platforms. Is that an experience that you that you have, or is that part of the offering that's to come? So, I mean, I mean, Noah, maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience with Nucleos to start. Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, so we haven't built out the full career piece on our platform yet. We're leveraging other technologies. It, it sounds like Resme may actually be focused more on this, so. We might let you speak to that. We're bringing in programs from places like Honest Jobs. The way our platform's looking at it is we're aggregating e-learning from whatever programs an agency might want to use, and we can bring in the best ones. Um, we're also thinking of aggregating all the jobs from different job platforms and helping do some matching. And we've seen some other very interesting career pathway programs we're looking to incorporate. Where maybe there's like 48 different career pathways, and you see videos of people talking about it. And, um, but it sounds like you might be doing that today. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's solid. That's solid. Yeah. So we have, I think we have like a two-pronged approach here. One is like actually going inside the facility. So particularly for the youth, I just have like, I was incarcerated as a youth, so I know it starts there. So that's, that's usually where we start, start our solutions. It's bringing professionals from the, the tech industry, right, to come and speak to the youth. We call them tech days. So people from Google, Meta, Reddit, Quora, LinkedIn, actually come into the facility, um, uh, not just for like mentoring, but to sit down with the youth, explain like a, a day in the life, have a meal with the youth, and then have some of that, those early connections happening on site. So we bring recruiters in, right? So you can understand like what is the process to actually getting a job in tech and design, right? To be a programmer or a business manager or other like functions within technology. Uh, so that, that's one way. And then the other way is pr providing like pathways on the platform, so on resume, right? There are, there are training programs, like if you wanted to become like a, like, like a truck driver, right? There's that. If you're looking to you know, become a programmer, right? Provide you know, free online courses through Cornell, Stanford Online, et cetera, um, so that you know there are different pathways, right? And then partnerships with people like Next Chapter when they have full programs, right? To help an individual like go through training, so a boot camp, and then place them at an apprenticeship at like Zoom or Dropbox or um, a number of other leading technology firms, PayPal, and the, list, and the list goes on. So making sure that individuals know that these pathways do exist and we have individuals who represent these organizations who are in a direct alignment with our mission, and some of them happen to be formally incarcerated. So it makes it, it, makes it real. Yeah. So, so with that, I think we're at time, and I just want to like, please join me in thanking Jody, Noah, and Ryan.